I first came here in 98 with my, my stock Tacoma pickup because I wanted to find out where the hammers were. And uh, came out to a rock crawling event up in, in uh, Wrecking Ball. And I just fell in love with this place. It's so big and you can go so, you can, used to be able to go for miles and miles and miles. They took half our land away, but uh, it, it's still huge. And I think I like the freedom. I love the desert because you can see so far and it's so wide open. And there's such a variety of things. You got everything, you got sand dunes, you got wide open desert, you got rock canyons, goat trails, things that you can, you can make it as hard as you want or just cruise around all day. It's really a neat area. I think it's, it's special, it's unique. The Mojave Desert, the driest desert in North America, located in the southwestern United States, Red hot on summer days, ice cold on winter nights. It represents one of the harshest environments our planet has to offer. Rocks found here date back 2.5 billion years, or half as old as the Earth itself, and remain to this day a roadmap to the history of its creation. Once a sprawling landscape of lakes and rivers, the Mojave came to be with the end of the last ice age and the rising of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Shielded from the coastal rains, the land would dry and become a vast, harsh, arid desert. Inside the mighty Mojave lies Johnson Valley, California, whose history reflects the harshness of its own environment. The U.S. military chose the area to train its forces to battle Rama and the Nazis in North Africa at the start of America's involvement in World War II. Sitting just outside the boundary of General Patton's massive 18,000 square mile desert training center, to the east, Johnson Valley would serve as a bombing range for the Army Air Force, what is now called Means Dry Lake, the base camp of King of the Hammers, in 1942 was referred to as Precision Bombing Range Y. PBRY would serve as one of the many ranges spread throughout Johnson Valley and beyond, 24 to be exact, used by aircraft operating out of Victorville Army Airfield to the west. Among these bombing ranges were large 600-foot wide concentric concrete target rings that were constructed as aiming guides for training bombers soaring high overhead, dropping sand-filled practice bombs. M38A2s being the weapon of choice. After the end of the war in 1948, the training area was deactivated and cleared of munitions, paving the way for the place we know today. Today, these target rings act as a fading reminder to the history of Johnson Valley as they deteriorate into the desert floor. The legendary hammer trails, born from the canyons of the Hartwell Hills, would begin to take shape in September of 1993 with the forging of Sledgehammer Canyon by the Victor Valley Four Wheelers, followed closely by Aftershock and Jackhammer the following year, beginning a growing network of trails leading into the present day. The Hammers would cement Johnson Valley as the premier off-highway vehicle area in the United States, and also the largest. I would say that Johnson Valley has a very raw feeling. It's it's like being on another planet almost. It's just very raw and, and then it's untouched. Um, the trails are just super gnarly and there's just, they're just limitless as far as where you can actually drive around here. It's this wasteland almost of nothingness and everything all in one. I mean, it's, it's so unforgiving, yet at the same time, it's like, uh, it's almost spiritual to be there when, when you're alone. I mean, it's one thing to be there race week and there's 60,000 people, but it's one of those places that just, it draws you in, you gravitate toward it when, you know, you're wired like these guys are out here, like me, and, and this is all we, all we breathe. I've come here and it rained 
I've come here and there was some snow on the hillside. It's windy almost all the time. It's hot, it's cold. We've started with ice on, on the puddles and uh, that same day you finish in a t-shirt. The first trail out here was Sledgehammer and that was the only trail. Now I'm sure there's 20, 30 trails and it's just all about people deciding, hey, let's see if we can follow this canyon up. There's no trail, of course. So just see if we can follow this canyon up to the top. So dirt, dust, silt, heat, cold, sand, rocks, canyons, lake beds up to speeds of 130 miles an hour. Fear, sticks, rocks, boulders, whoops, you name it, we got it all. I mean, we're, we're playing around in boulders that, are, that most people can't even walk through. By 2007, it would also provide the catalyst for the hardest off-road race the country had seen yet. The event would eventually grow from 12 guys in the lake bed on a Friday, what was known as the OG 13 in 2007, to a week-long spectacle that attracts competitors and spectators the world over, totaling an estimated 60,000 people to an otherwise deserted desert valley. There was 12 people, not 13. It's called the OG 13, but there was actually only 12. And OG 13 just sounded better, so it stuck. There was 16 vehicles on the lake bed, but only 11 people showed up that we invited. And uh, Scott and Jeff were there, and they were just wheeling. We're like, hey, you should do this. We're like, yeah, OK. And so they became OG then. Um, there was probably a handful of other people there. We had. Um, some guy in a samurai that just happened to be there and he's like, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm gonna chase this race around a race. What are you talking about, a race worth the hammers? Yeah, I know. Back in 07, I got invited to go out to Johnson Valley, never been out there before. Brandon from Crawl Magazine, we were doing a shoot in Moab, and he goes, man, you gotta come, you gotta come, you gotta come. It's this big race, it's gonna be cool, it's gonna be epic one day. I didn't have any money, I'd just blown all my sponsorship money on the XRA race in Moab, and he's like, call your sponsors, have them send you some money and go, it's gonna be worth it. So the race, when we did the OG race, there was no tech, no entry fee, we got a case of beer. And there was probably 40 people on the lake bed. We started and did a shotgun start. So all 12 cars were lined up side by side on the lake bed and they dropped the flag and we took off. All right, I'm gonna sit over here. I'm gonna stand on top of the car. Raise my hands up, 10 seconds. Drop the hands and peel out. No window nets, in t-shirts, open face helmets, air shocks, no GPS, and <laughs> it was uh, it was tough. When I crossed the finish line in 2007, uh, Dave Cole drove up at the end of the last trail on his quad and said, "Congratulations, you finished the race." And that was it. It was kind of <laughs> where's the dancing girls? I didn't see any. And I met up with one of the competitor's wife, who sort of knew me, and she said, JR, what are you doing out here? So it, it was kind of a letdown, but uh, there, there was hardly anybody here at that time, that's for sure. <laughs> it was very, very informal. And, uh, you know, Dave was out there on the rocks and we were just driving by, and, you know, it was no fanfare at the end, no champagne, no kissing babies. Not even a checkered flag, it was just like, cool. <laughs> Good mama, bro. I did tell those guys on the lake bed, yeah, since you guys race this race, you won't have to qualify when we get really big. And they would just looked at me like I was insane. And I'm like, oh, it's gonna happen. We're gonna be, you're gonna have to qualify. Drink another beer, Dave. And we drank another beer. <laughs> made up more crap and while Jeff wasn't at that race, that race would not have happened without him. Yeah, Casey Folks, remember he's like, you, you gotta have a name for your class. You can't yep. just call it 4400, you have to have a name for the class, so yep. you need a name. And he's like, I just wanna call them hammer cars. And I'm like, Casey, no, we don't wanna call, like, we're gonna, we want we have big, bigger aspirations than just King of Hammers. We wanna like throw this thing. Yep. So we, we soundboarded a bunch of names. And I remember I was working, uh, I was building an elephant bar. I was under the under the bar, working on the bar, and Casey called me. 
and he says, dude, I gotta have a name like we're going to print. And I said, let's call it Ultra 4. That's, a, that's the one we like the best. We're gonna call it Ultra 4. And, he, and I remember him going, I hope this isn't a PG version, but he says, what the f is that? <laughs> I'm like, Casey, what do you mean what the f is it? Sounds like an ultralight. Those things crash. I said, yeah, so do we. Fit. You're talking about Casey. I remember when we first started talking about going, trying to get him to accept this to go racing, and I called him up and and uh, hey Casey, you know this Dave and blah blah blah. And the word we got the king of the hammers cars, and he's like, Dave, you do realize we are a go fast racing organization? <laughs> yes, Casey. You guys don't go fast. Okay, Casey. You're gonna have to have a blue light. You're just gonna, you're gonna be, you're, no, you're gonna be so slow. Okay, Casey, whatever, whatever you say, we'll to get it, just let us, let us go race. I'll, we'll prove you wrong. And we didn't have that blue light for a long, one year. Yeah. But we cut our teeth and we learned, and, and the racers, they, they did a good job of putting on a good face and people talked about it, it was cool. It so. was, remember we had the t-shirts that said, uh, you got passed by a rock crawler? Yeah, yeah, that just happened. <laughs> so my bumper sticker on my yeah. car yeah, just happened, good. you got passed by a rock crawler. So, and then yeah. my car burned down 110 miles later, but... <laughs> we had a, a lot of fun. I remember drawing that logo at the taco stand. Yeah, that was right. I do at the that taco too. stand on the, whatever, right south of the 10. We drew yeah. that. I remember drawing that. I'm like, oh, we, we have to make it look like it's fast because we're slow. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll put, we'll put the lines behind it. It'll make us look like we're fast. <laughs> oh, and then you're like, but they're not going to know where to find us. Okay, then we'll put the website on the top. And that's when we put the website up on top, and that logo literally has not changed. And it's, it's since we drew it on the map, we went to um, Chris Schutt, and we had a logo. And so Dave Cole started talking about running all the trails in one in one race, and um, we said, let's let's do it next spring. We're like, all right. Well, 06 came around, nobody did it. Finally, 07 came around, and uh, he called uh, about 50 guys. All 50 people were like, yeah, we're gonna be there. And nope, 13 of us showed up, and uh, so it's just you know it's. It's a local place for us, so that that's where our interest is. Yeah, because they only knew what it was going to turn into. Yeah. I guarantee you all 50 would have shown up. Yeah, so many people come up to me like, oh man, I was, I was supposed to come and I didn't come, and I, I wish I could have been one of those original guys. Dave Cole is one of our club members, member of the Tin Benders. Jeff knows somebody I've known for a long time. When they did the original OG race, that year I was spotting for Hobie Smith in the Formula Toy in the We Rock series. And Dave says, hey, come on out and do this thing and, and bring your cars. I really need some help with this. And you know, my, I had a transmission that was blown in this thing. So I thought, ah, this is such a dumb idea. I'll just go out and ride with, ride with Hobie for the day, no biggie and you know. So it started there. So the reason it's called the OG 13 is after that first race, about halfway through the next year, when Dave told me we were gonna do it for real, um, I was gonna make t-shirts for all the guys that raced, for the drivers that raced the first one. And so I called Dave and I said, hey, how many, how many were there? And he goes, uh, 13. I said, okay, you want uh, original guys 13, OG 13? He's like, yeah, that sounds cool, I like it. So I get to the lake bed at the driver's meeting and I'm handing out the t-shirts and I went, hey, who's the 13th guy? And he goes, it was only 12. Okay. <laughs> a city would rise from the lake bed floor, a network of RVs, trailers, and tow rigs. This city would come to be known simply as Hammertown. Hammertown had Wi-Fi, a temporary power grid, bathrooms, a signed road system, food and water, even UPS would deliver. 351 days a year, Means Dry Lake existed as a quiet, desolate, desert landscape. However, for the two weeks surrounding King of the Hammers, it would become the epicenter of activity for miles in any direction. 59,000 square feet of tents, uh, probably 80 different units. We have uh, full service Wi-Fi internet, we've got a jumbotron, we've got power, sanitation. We've basically built a town out here. We had a surveyor come and lay out our vendor row and our tents. It's 23 acres of camping. Just our hammer town is bigger than a half mile NASCAR track. And there's more, and there's more people camping here than there's camping there. So you, 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 don't, you don't just set up for the one day race, that's easy. It's setting up for 10 days, 15 days of having people move out to the desert, knowing that you're 20 miles away from the closest electricity. You have to be prepared. 
KOH would eventually grow to have multiple classes and hundreds of competitors, ranging from motorcycles and Jeeps all the way to the top dogs of the Unlimited Ultra 4 class. Each class would have its winner throughout the week. However, the top honor would be the crowning of King, the winner of the few hundred mile unlimited race, traditionally on Friday of race week. At the, at the SEMA show in Las Vegas in 2008, uh, Dave Cole walked up to me and said, I have a dream. Would you mind me sharing it with you? And I, we weren't sure where, the, where he was going with that. And he said, what if you took rock racing and, and, off, and, and rock crawling, uh, mixed it with some high speed, and didn't have any rules? Yeah, in, in short, he basically told us, from a marketing perspective anyways, that he wanted to have an event that's never been done. And, and second of all, an event in a place that no one ever goes. And then lastly, a event that requires a car that no one's ever built. And so I kind of just looked at him and, and smiled and just wondered. I mean, I was in complete awe. It was just a, you want to do what? KOH really has changed the industry and I think they've reacted because I remember a comment back in, in 2008. People changed, your, changed their cars for you. They, they had competition rock crawlers and they chopped off all their suspension and changed it to have their suspension done. I think the whole industry has done that. They've, they've changed to, to respond to KOH. So our first King of the Hammers, man, I hope I don't mess up the dates, but I think it's 2007 for us. So it was the OG 13. We were uh, working with Tracy Jordan at the time. And then my first official year would have been following that. It was a special event. You have to kind of use your imagination a little bit. It, it wasn't quite like it is today. There were a, a lot of vehicles for us. I mean, a few dozen, if I remember correctly, that showed up. And so, oh my goodness, you know, um, for the race, which was one day. So you would go out there a, you know, a day or two before maybe and hang out a little bit and, and do this race, which if I remember correctly, was on a Friday, just like it is now. So our first King of the Hammers was that. We were not the official axle at that time. We manufactured an axle called the Spider 9 that was really designed for rock crawling. High angle of steering, uh, packed uh, wicked strength to weight ratio, and that's kind of what made the axle so special. It was very light for the, for the punch that it, that it could pack, and it just naturally kind of fell into the King of the Hammer style racing. You wanted light axles, you wanted to be able to go fast, but uh, keeping those vehicles light was kind of the magic and, and how you can go fast and not constantly break. We, we had a, a significant rock crawling background, but as King of the Hammers kind of made its, its staple and, and I think it made itself clear that it wasn't going away anytime soon, uh, the axles just kind of naturally gravitated toward that crowd, even in their form for rock crawling, because the axles that you know, were deemed kind of the axles you would maybe do for racing, they were just too heavy. So the spider on axle just kind of fit that crowd. And how King of the Hammers transformed us was really the drivers in that sport. They wanted to go faster, they wanted to steer sharper, they wanted to be lighter, they wanted the components to be stronger. And so the, the level of, of manufacturing and the level of engineering to accommodate really the path of where these drivers wanted to go, which was lighter and faster. Uh, that definitely transformed the Spider 9 line uh, in a big way. Nitto sat on the sidelines and watched KOH for a couple of years until jumping in roughly 2012. But we developed a 40 inch tall tire with the purpose of both desert and rock. We knew it had potential, but we didn't expect KOH to grow to the level that it is today. It's, it's grown quite a bit and it's been a good fit for Nitto. Nitto was the first company that really vetted us. I have a feeling they were looking at us for years before they talked to us. Tim Colty was the marketing manager at the time. He had come around, he had worked with, the, with Randy Rod and they were doing some stuff with Randy Rod. I got a call, asked me if I'd come over and talk to Tomo, who's a, now he's the president of Nitto Tire USA. He knew everything. He knew everything about us. And, I, and to me that was, that wasn't how we did sponsorship before that. It was, hi, I'm Dave, I'm Jeff. Trust us, we're doing something cool. Can, you, can we have 500 bucks? Here's can, smoke. Can, we, can we have, can we have a, it, it was all, and they came at us with, so we've done research on your, on your, on your demographic. You have these many racers, you, it was like, wow. 
never thought about it that way. Nitto as a tire company is not, not a big company per se that most people would think of. While we're, our sister company is Toyo Tires, Nitto is a direct American spin-off with American distribution. With that, we're a company of roughly 45 employees here in Cypress, California, but we're really a small niche group. Uh, most people think that you know, the Nitto marketing department is you know, 30 people or so because we are very efficient. Uh, we like to take the sniper shot approach within a market versus a broad throw it at the wall and see what sticks. They came at us from a different angle. Truly appreciated what we had built and had no intention on trying to change it. It afforded me at the time to go do bigger and dumber stuff. <laughs> Tom Beebe and Griffin came along at the right time and were the perfect partner at the time. Nitto came along at the right time and they've been the perfect partner through this next phase of our life. If you want to prove that your product can withstand off-road, can your winch make it work? Can your lockers get you through some brutal terrain? The place to test that has been the hammers. I, it hammers your vehicle, but it's also where all of the aftermarket products have been tested and proven to be the, the best products out there. Johnson Valley is Darwin's playground. Push yourself, go out into the middle of the desert, see what happens, uh, climb those rocks, look out for that mine shaft that's been there for over 100 years. Oh, and did we mention there's bomb craters here? And so my first year down here, it was nothing like this. It was, it was still big for being out here in the desert, but it was not what it is today. And now you get down here and, and you've got, you know, of course, Ward and, and Jeep guys down here from the factory. I've seen a few Ford guys. It's a, it's a big deal. And really when it started, it was a real grassroots thing. It was some enthusiasts from Warren coming down. You know, we knew a lot of folks were running uh, our winches on their vehicles. And so we came down to see how we can support them. And over the years, it's really grown into, you know, full-blown race support. We were visiting the racers and one-on-one -on -one ensuring that their winches are set up correctly on their cars to ensure that when it comes time for them to use our product, it's going to work 100% of the time. When you look at the evolution of a sport like King of the Hammers, and and again, it's special to us because we had an opportunity to be there really from day one. That sport warranted not just, you know, bigger things. So it was, it was always about making things stronger. We have uh, axle shafts where 40 spline is now the standard. But to make them more competitive, they're gun drilled. So they'll have a large hole down the center of the shaft because all your strength really comes on the outside for you engineers out there, you know, right? It's, areas to the factor too so which makes for a product that is maybe a little heavier than what we were doing but substantially stronger so axle splines have gotten larger housings have gotten larger suspensions have changed so drivetrain components are now geared for not just solid axles but independent suspensions you know so at our test lab back at the factory in oregon you know we have vibration tables we have cold chambers hot chambers you know, when we test our winches all the way past stall, the remotes, you know, can go on a shaker table and simulate the environment that they have to survive in out here. And then we bring it out here, you know, and we have much more confidence in our product and the racers do too, because they've come up and toured our factories. It's, you know, it takes some of the stress off of their, you know, building the race car. Johnson Valley has rocks that even KOH cars can't climb. Apparently they needed the dustiest, muddiest, driest, hottest, coldest place on the planet, and they did well in finding it. ARB didn't set out to get into motorsport. We started into four-wheel drive accessories, specifically the air locker line, 30 years ago, developing traction aids for off-roaders in Australia. 200 live differential applications later, we tested the prototypes for RD99C at KOH in Shannon Campbell's car. The year following that, we released it to the general public. Motorsport was able to go to larger tires, bigger motors, heavier GVMs, and after long, it needed a diff that could handle really, really high output for that 35 spline shaft. This is our RD249 CE. It's the latest addition to our racing series of air locker locking differential products. It's a first that anyone's taken a racing manually selectable traction aid this far into the, uh, the realm of desert racing, rock racing, rock crawling. We've had more than a year's worth of testing behind this product prior to launch and it tested very very well.
I guess it's just the, uh, the grandeur of it. Everybody jumped on it as far as competitors. They changed their cars. They took rock crawlers and did the best they could to turn them into go fast cars. And then it just snowballed after that, I think. People like me that like racing and, but don't race got sucked in for the same reasons. It's incredible. It represents the idea that people should take risks and try things no matter the cost. You just have to go do it. You have to try. You have to take your idea and go do it. If you don't, you're not living your life. Like, there's guys that live in a cube all day long and never take a risk and show, and they hate their miserable freaking job and they don't do anything. And then there's people that will literally mortgage their house to build a car and go do some ridiculous race out in the desert that's nearly impossible just for the sake of doing it. It's, it's, I guess that's what King of the Hammers is for me. It's just about taking the risk and going for it. Well, at Allcom, it's months and months and months of preparation and spending money and, and then you're moving up to the starting line and your heart's just going, you know, and it's like this fight or flight thing and it has no purpose in, the, in sitting behind a race car. The focus gets down to not about all the details of the race and the car, but it's about beating the guy next to me in the first 100 feet. That's all I'm concerned about, just one thing at a time. For me, King of the Hammers is uh, some kind of weird, psychotic community that all bands together so they can beat the crap out of each other, yet still find a way to make sure everybody gets to the end together. Get to the end, to win finish whatever their goal is some some people's goal is just getting there just to qualify some people's goal is to beat their buddy some people's goal is to get the first lap second lap finish the race some people's goal is to win and dominate it was the right time and the way that Dave and Jeff approached it the first race year after the OG race because they said hey we're gonna have this event and uh, you, you can't come no spectators no vendors, you can't come. When you tell somebody they can't, they want it. And they built off of that, that race and that place. It, it's, it's a special deal. Anybody who wants a different challenge in life can find a way to challenge themselves out here. Whether they are you know, the best mechanic in their shop or they are the doctor, the vet. We have them all out here. And the reality is, is one of the things that's critical to King of the Hammers and Ultra 4 is we want this to always be something that anybody can get involved in because it really did start off as guys taking their recreational vehicles and turning them into race cars. We want there to always be an entry point for the family that wants to come up with a way to challenge themselves to come out here and make that happen. I think the, the question of how did King of the Hammers influence us it goes both ways. It changed spider tracks and, and how to accommodate you know, the demands of what these Ultra 4 vehicles need, but at the same time, it, it changed us and, and what we do. It's the, the center of people's reason to do things. It's the reason why everybody comes to your shop and sits in a shop like this and drinks with their friends and keeps building something. It's, the vehicle to get you to your goal. It's whatever you make it out to be. That's part of that culture we have. It's, it's whatever you want it to be. The payoff of Ultra 4 Racing, I don't know if there is one. It's like a drug. It's this 90-10, 95-5, blood, sweat, and tears, misery, hard work, constant uphill struggle of torture you put yourself through to get to this event for that that just the 5% and it all makes it worth it. It's, but I mean, there's nothing quite like putting your helmet on, locking the window net, tightening the belts and, and peeling out on the track. It's the idea of being able to compete against the best in the world and be the best in the world. And it just, it drives you like, like nothing else. I mean, it's, it's all, that, all that I think of uh, when I'm not doing it. And I don't know what I'd do if, if, it, if it all went away. It's just, it's my life. You got all the fast guys pushing and really testing the equipment and pushing it over the edge. But at the same time, the slowest guy, the turtle, that just keeps on chugging, that keeps moving, that knows what his car is doing, what his parts are doing. Sometimes attrition wins the race, you know, or wins the race for a guy, you know. It's, and that's what I've taught my kids over the years is, I don't want you to go out there and race this race, I want you to go out there and finish it. And if you finish, I tell them you'll be in the top 10. KOH is special to me because of the, the people 
because of the tech, the cars, the technology, the campers, the campfires, the, the weather. There's so many odd components that are outside of the norm when you're standing on the lake bed that all fit together. Uh, sometimes you don't see people all year, but you'll see them on the lake bed. And you shake hands and you, you, know, you have a beer at a campfire and you catch up on the year's activities. Life's, life's pretty short. You don't get many of those opportunities. And that's, I always recommend to everybody, come to KOH and have that beer. Um, be part of that group, be part of that family. Come and enjoy it because suddenly you look back and you say, wow, yeah, I've been coming there for eight years and I didn't really realize it, but look at all the memories that I generated in eight years. I mean, it's, it's really a reflection. Sometimes when you're standing there at KOH and you're brushing your teeth with silt and sand and it's blowing and you're going, what the hell am I doing here? That's the part you, that you, that's short-term memory. The long-term memory is when you go home and you go back to your normal life in your office and your desk and you're, and you're reflecting back and you're thinking, you know what, I had a great time. That was an amazing place. Like, I met cool people, saw good racing, you know? And that's the, that's the KOH that, uh, to me, is important. KOH is, is a runaway train, you know it's coming, and you're laying track. The track ends, and you're trying to lay track as fast as you can, but that zero hour is going to come, and that train is going to be here, and then it's going to go where it wants. And that's kind of the feeling.